Atsuro Taira has an opportunity to do something really interesting. He's legitimately one of the last phenoms that you have that's undefeated. He is a specializer when it comes down to grappling right here, can do it on the hands, but more important is he is putting the country of Japan on his back. The hard part is undefeated 16 and 0. Now you got the raw dog in front of you, Brandon Roy Val, a former title challenger. And if there's anything that this contest is going to do here, it's going to prove that our goal right now as an organization, as a company that is the Bloody Water Podcast, partnering with the UFC, make the flyweight division great again. That's what we're here to do, baby. Breaking it down with me, as always, my co host, the Santa Fe Bomber, the New Mexico native. AJ, we got global implications here. The country of Japan is trying to find a new phenom right but the raw dog he wants to put ends to that and he definitely wants to get another shot against alessandre pantojo whoever will be the belt holder when the time comes really interesting matchup what do you make of it incredibly interesting matchup derek i feel like we need to get some red hats going to make the flyweight uh the division good again brother but really is this is the fight right this is yeah. not necessarily the old school in Brandon Roy Vall, but somewhat of a more veteran fighter versus one of the young guns that's coming up that's going to be here for a while i am very excited for this weekend man yeah, man, it's really interesting how it works because Brandon Roy Vall was the shiny new toy not that long ago, but that's how the game goes, man. If you're not active, if you're not winning, people are passing you up. And we got two winners, right? At least if you're looking at Roy Val, he just beat a former champ in Moreno and then Tatsuro Tyra undefeated. A lot of other fun fights that we're going to break down here in just a few moments, folks. But you know, before we do anything, if you are a fan of this program, it is the accountability hour. And we're going to go ahead and uh, take a look back at UFC 307 championship fights right here. Here and uh, listen, you see a lot of red on my side of the board if you are simply uh, just watching this one. If you're listening to this one, this is the recap here. AJ, you had yourself a night four and one on your picks, two and uh, three for me, and then two and one overall on the consensus picks. Given that you always break down our consensus picks, two and one ain't bad. Aldo, brother, I mean, talk, just talk to the people. What did you make of it? Man, yeah, Derek. I almost almost got the five and zero over there for the for the three hundred seven card, brother. It was um, I, I, like not unexpected, right? We we kind of called it, right? Mario Batista is gonna put some work in. Aldo, he can't really find a way. But this this was an interesting one because I'm not necessarily upset with the decision that was made, but I know some people out there were clamoring that some foolery. Tom Foolery was afoot. I mean, judging was all over the place at uh, Salt Lake City, but most important is who expected Batista to give Aldo the Marab treatment, right? He gave him the Devalish Willy treatment, which is weird. Hold him against the cage and just kind of see how things play out. But that's neither here nor there. We said we can't bet against Aldo until somebody beats him and somebody beat him. So now the door has been opened. More important right here, just give us a quick takeaway, man. I'm not going to say you got lucky, AJ, because luck is in the game. I'd rather be lucky than to be good, right? Oftentimes, uh, Juliana Pena. You said she is a dog. She had a real chance at victory, and she did. It's not like it was a runaway fight on any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but just to allude to something we'll talk about a little bit later, just let me know, brother. Did we get lucky? Was it a robbery? Did you get lucky? Or uh, what, what do you make of it? Sometimes you'd rather be lucky than good, Derek. <laughs> but yeah, I got my shiesty mask as well whenever these judges were out there. And I saw how things, the night was going. All right. Well, fair play, man. Uh, we just take it what it is, man. Wins, losses. We don't look into the past. We look into the future. And before we do that, let's just say props, just bricks across the board, man. We, we didn't hit on props, parlays, one and one. The lead Dan Buckley. You got to love that, man. So shout out, victory lap on that one. Let's go to some bets where we're going to make some real cash, though, brother. You know what I'm saying? Let's move to UFC Vegas 98. And uh, without any further ado, we're going to cue the music up. You know what I'm saying? We're ready to go. Consensus picks, man. We got a lot of them right here. Six fights on the main card docket. Five fights you need to know about for consensus picks. Tatsuro Taira, Jun Young Park, Chitty Bang Bang and Jaquani, Grant Dawson, and Abdul Razak Al Hassan. AJ, that's the consensus picks. Since it's so many this week, give me just a nice, clean, uh, just kind of cue for like, what is this about? What's the, what's the theme? The theme this week, Derek, I'll make it easy, man. Consistency, sticking to the game plan. Fair. I like it. I was trying to take a look and just think like, hmm, does everybody fit the bill? But I think everybody just about does fit the bill. So the one contentious pick that we got right here, Alex Morono versus Daniel Rodriguez, a late uh, addition to the card right here. Um, we're going to talk and break down all of these fights in depth, but just tell me uh, from that contentious pick, what made you uh, side with Rodriguez? Ooh, he's the he's the favorite going into this one, Derek, but I feel like he's evolved his game enough to deal with what Moreno is going to have to offer. 
All right, and I'm gonna go on the flip side. I think Morono is actually getting discounted based off of his last performance. It was a short notice performance, about four week notice. Cardio looked terrible, but he was doing great until he wasn't. We'll break it down and more. Prop locks, AJ, talk to the people, what do you got? Woo, prop lock this week, folks. Stemba Garimbo versus Price. This fight's going to the distance at plus 125. A very, very hard fight right here with quality opponents. And or when Garimbo's fighting quality opponents, he not necessarily struggles, but he does have a harder time. Price is more calculated than ever. Last win by KO was James Vick in 2019, so five years ago. I see this one going to the distance. I like that one. I got one on mine that I just think is a layup right here. And if it hits, this is the biggest victory lap ever. Grant Dawson versus Rafa Garcia. A real step down in competition based on who he's fought recently. Dawson by sub, plus 400. If he gets the fight to the ground, I think that it might just be a wrap. Maybe a TKO comes, but here's the thing. Rafa Garcia, he's never been uh, submitted in his entire career. Mm. Grant Dawson might be the guy to make it happen. We'll see. All right, for the parlays right here, you got a, uh, we got a couple fun ones right here. Sharaf and Taffa, Junior Taffa, super short notice fight under one and a half rounds, heavyweights, that makes sense. With the Jonathan uh, JSP Pierce money line, parlay it together, plus 112. What do you like about it, brother? I like this one because uh, Taffa, only one fight that goes over one and a half rounds. And against this UFC newcomer in Sharaf, who has zero fights that go over one and a half rounds, you parlay that with the favorite in JSP in the money line. Like you said, Derek, at plus 112, you're making some cash this weekend. I like that. Another one on top of it, Rodriguez Morono over two and a half rounds plus a Grand Dawson money line at plus 102. As you can see, it was chalk. That's why when you parlay together, we barely get the plus money. But I like the plus money for two very likely outcomes right there. So took a little bit longer than normal, but that was your UFC Vegas 98 consensus. Uh, not just consensus, but that was just the whole bet sheet. Folks, again, if you are listening to this one, because you do have the ability to do so now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever else you get your podcasts at, make sure you rate us five stars. And if you're watching like the tried and true, the bloody water podcast army then you know what time it is time to break down some main card picks baby let's get it here's to another main card breakdown courtesy of your hosts derek g and aj all right folks you know what the deal is again to the newbies for this program here if you have not watched this program yet, what you need to know is we're going to break down all of the main card bouts. All six of them. We're starting with the main event, working our way all the way down to the first one. After that, we're going to have some bonus plays for you, only for those who stick around. Those will be exclusive here. You won't hear them or see them posted anywhere else. And then we get into some news and notes and some sleepers. A lot of fun stuff on the docket for you. So AJ, you know what time it is. Let's break it down. Brandon, the raw dog, Roy Val. He gets the undefeated Tatsuro Tyro, which almost feels like a punishment after beating uh, a former champion, Brandon Moreno and then, you know, having that championship fight with Alessandre Pantoja. But I think what they're really trying to do is they're trying to build both fighters. If Brandon Roy Val can stave off an undefeated 16-0 prospect who's going to be the pride of Japan, AJ, his stock goes through the roof. But at the same time, it almost feels like they're kind of feeding him to Tatsuro Taira because this dude is a phenom grappler. And when he gets his hands on you, oftentimes dudes don't make it out. So I wanted your initial impression. Minus 195 was the open for Tatsuro Taira. Fair? Very fair, Derek. I mean, uh, it, especially if you're looking at the type of competition, right? Especially in lately in the odds, we've seen stuff that's off the jump, right? For the main events, plus two or minus two thirty, minus three hundred. This right here for Tatsudo Tyra, especially at seventeen and zero, is a very respectable price. And if he's able to get this against the Raw Dog, man, you're going to see him up in that two thirty to three hundred mark that I was talking about. Uh, that's steep right there man but you're right you're right this dude's got skills but when i look at this fight i look at brandon roy val having one asset that tatsuro tyra just hasn't quite ran into yet and it's the guy that's non-stop it's the energizer bunny right it's the i'm in your face i'm breaking you down with pressure for five rounds i will not stop and oftentimes this is what's tough about brandon roy val is the thing that he's best at is the thing that can be his worst enemy in this fight because if you're forward if you're non-stop throwing stuff throwing kicks all that stuff right awesome but if tatsudo tyra grabs you one time this dude's jujitsu and his just overall grappling transitions and scrambles are so elite he's locking these dudes up look what he did to alex perez took his back did that little weird shift and blew the dude's knee out but it all came from just getting his hands on him one time how can brandon roy val use that pace to his advantage, use that cardio pace without getting grabbed. 
He's going to have to work off the jab, Derek. We know, we know Raw Dog has fast hands, but staying long, staying lanky, and just working off that jab consistently, throwing some kicks, throwing some T-kicks, especially working the body, throwing some stuff up the middle to the bread basket, having Tatsuro Tyra think, is that a knee or is that something that's going to hit me down here? Like this, the, the, Getting him thinking, showing him something that's different. And another X, X factor, I was thinking about this one, Derek. Yes, the pressure works, but also the, the relentless – chaos if you will that that Roy Ball presents he has that x factor where things happen that not a lot of people expect that he can get done and with a technical fighter like Tyra that could also be a problem right here when you take a look at the numbers right here, I mean, Roy Val is going to be a little bit bigger. Reach isn't quite as long, but if you look at anything that is notable right here, it's one, it's going to be the, the uh, stance, southpaw. And then number two, it's going to be the significant strikes landed per minute. Like you said, he's always in your face, being able to put himself in a position to just bring chaos, man. But what's the one thing that Alessandre Pantoja did when he fought him, bro? He said, you can be as chaotic as you want. If I can get your back on the mat, it does not matter. So jujitsu here. Roy Val, six scrambles, but is this a fight where he cannot afford to make it to the ground at all? Like the ground is lava in this matchup. Is that fair? Absolutely lava, Derek, 100%. All right, well, let's break down these numbers then, man, because this seems pretty binary to me. That would make Roy Val the striker in this camp. That'd make Tatsuro Tyra the grappler, but Tatsuro Tyra also thrives. He thrives in just like a technical kickboxing match, right? So the uglier that Roy Val could make it, the better for him, ideally. Counters, tie clinches. This all has to be in your mind when you think about, all right, what prop can hit right here? Tatsuro Tyra, since he's the favorite, since he's the consensus pick, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you, man. I like the plus 135 submission right here. If you look at Brandon Roy Val, when's the last time the man has lost via submission? It was to Pantoja when he got choked out to Pantoja, right? This dude doesn't get submitted a lot, and he has good grappling right here. So plus 135, do you see value in Tyra being able to get this out of there relatively early because we're going to have to start looking into some overs and some unders right here to kind of couple along to bring real value here. What do you think? I think, uh, especially for the submission, Derek, at plus 135, it's going to have to come early, going to have to come by surprise while there's still a little dry going in there. And and while Tyra is still strong. I mean, if you're, if you're in fourth and fifth rounds, you might not have the gas tank that Broy Val has because he's going to keep that pressure going. Dog, looking at it now, it's funny you say that because Tyra has only gone three rounds twice in, or no, three times in the last 10 fights, right? And the last one that he had against Edgar Chaires, right? He put it on him the whole fight, but you did see he got caught up in a little guillotine at the end, right? Like you do gas, you do fatigue the longer the fight goes. And if, especially if you're doing a lot of grappling and it's just ineffective, right? Like it's like you're controlling, but you're not able to actually find that finish. So if we're betting on the Roy Val side of things right here, man, is there any prop that looks enticing to you while I pull up the over under? Ooh, I, uh, strictly props, Derek. I don't know if he's going to be able to get a knockout on, on Tatsuro Tyra because he's so technical in the stand-up and in that kickboxing range. I think the prop that makes the most sense is by decision. All right, then. Three and a half rounds. I imagine you're taking minus 125 with the over, yeah? Minus 125 for the over, for sure. Brother, there's something that tells me, man, and I don't want to be too aggressive here, but that under, minus 105, if a submission happens, I, I really see it coming earlier than that. I, I don't see it coming later. So that's the camp we're playing. We're saying if it's a submission, it gets done early, but we're leaning decision if, if he can't get it in the first couple of rounds, yeah? Yeah. Sheesh, man. All right, fair play. I don't really have much else to add on this one. I know that we know who we think the victor is going to be. And give me a final take on this one, man. Stock rising. For Tatsuro Tyra, if he wins this one, we're pretty much saying you're ready for the championship, right? You beat the number one contender. It's pretty much as simple as that. So what does the stock look like on both ends of this? For Tyra, future champ type situation, but for Roy Val, with a big win over this, what does it mean? Does he get another title shot immediately next? No, I, unfortunately, I don't think that's necessarily the case for Roy Ball. I mean, he's fought Pantoja twice, so yeah. there could be in the works for another championship fight. But uh, I just think this is one of those ones where it solidifies Brandon Roy Ball as that top dog, not necessarily gatekeeper, but but gatekeeper into the top 10, into the top five upper echelon of the crowd. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty fair analysis right there. Brandon Roy Val, the more you look at it, brother, it looks like they're trying to feed you to the dogs, but we're a fan of him over here. So with that being said, that is your main event. Luckily, implications don't matter. We're looking to make money, and those are your plays right there. Submission prop, write it, plus 135 if it goes early, or if you just want to be a little bit more general, feel free, minus 125 on the over three and a half rounds. Moving 
on to the co-main event. Man, this dude, Brad Tavares, right? I looked at this matchup versus Jun Young Park, and I was like, man, why does this feel so familiar? Oh, that's right. They're supposed to fight back in like July, right? But then Jun Young Park, after we broke down the tape, we actually already did an episode on this one, man, where we broke it down. So hopefully it's not too different. But uh, yeah, medical uh, issue for Jun Young Park um, for the weigh-ins or something like that, and he couldn't he couldn't fight. But we got it rebooked. All right, man, the mean-spirited Brad uh, Tavares, and I say that in all the best ways, right? He's got a fight in front of him against Jun Young Park because this dude Jun Young Park who I still feel doesn't get the respect that he deserves opened up as a minus 175 favorite given that I mean he has all the all the tools and all the intangibles I think to be able to win this matchup but Brad Tavares is always going to be a hard out how does Brad Tavares bounce back from that TKO loss against Gregory Rodriguez without kind of mimicking the same style man he's a comfortable fighter behind that black line and Jun Young Park has some great grappling that Tavares doesn't really have to counter, right? So it's pretty much, again, striker versus grappler. How does this one uh, play out? If if uh, Brad Tavares wants to not mimic the performance he had against, against Gregory Rodriguez, he's going to have to stay a distance on this one, man. I, and, and the Iron Turtle, right? He's going to walk you down. He's going to shell up. He's going to keep that consistent pressure. But if you're able to do some damage, we've seen Jung Young Park not necessarily respond the best, right? He'll he'll shelter a little. He'll 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 step back. He'll falter if uh, if put the pressure is put on him. But Brad Tavares in that same aspect, man, we've seen him try to put that fight into style, and it just doesn't ever work out for him. Especially with the gas tank issues we've seen him have, this seems to be a very uphill battle for Brad Tavares. Yeah, uh, uphill battle to a degree. I mean, the biggest problem, in my opinion, is that he just doesn't have grappling to give back to Jun Young Park to stave off those takedown attempts, right? So you're going to want to strike, but he's going to be stuck behind the black line and probably doing a lot of just like get off me on the cage type stuff. But I think, I, I don't know, let's take a step back. I was actually going to talk about the over and under, but like really quickly before we do that, you were saying cardio is one of the bigger issues for Brad Tavares. You think that he's going to gas out over three rounds against Park? Not necessarily gas out like we've seen in the past, but mm -hmm. but slow down the production and the output that Brad Tavares has. And especially with the power that he likes to throw, we've mm -hmm. seen that gas pedal just falter a little bit. Okay, I mean, you're right. Jun Young Park's almost five significant strikes landed per minute, so dude is pretty active. The biggest thing that I was going to say is if Park can get the takedown, man, five of his six career submissions are via rear naked choke. Like, that's definitely an option, I would say. Um, but, I mean, I don't know, man. Brad Tavares is a dude who's always going to be a tough out. Even that TKO loss against Gregory Rodriguez, it's not something that I really anticipated. But now, when you're saying, all right, in your last four fights, or in your last five fights, right, Two of those losses by nasty knockout, Bruno Silva and uh, Gregory Rodriguez. I don't know if Jun Young Park can replicate that kind of power to put him out, though. No, I don't think necessarily the power. I just think the domination and, and the w unwillingness to take a step backward step that Jung Young Park is going to have. I don't know if Brad Tavares has the tools necessary to be able to put that fear in Park. Do we feel confident enough that Brad Tavares could stave him off long enough to hit two and a half rounds, the over at minus 265? That's a, that's a really good question, Derek. Two and a half rounds, two minute, two and a half minutes left in the fight. Can he get there? I give a lot of credit to Brad Tavares, man. I, I think he can. Yeah, I'm looking at these losses, bro. A lot of these losses are coming late too, man. So that you definitely have to take that into consideration. And if Jun Young Park, who just got, let's not forget, man, he just got pretty dominated by Andre Muniz, by another grappler. Given that he's fighting a dude who's a pure striker, I think one thing he's going to want to be wary of is the power that's going to be returning from him, from Brad Tavares. Because Tavares is an interesting thing. He'll coast along the, the, the black line, right? But he'll try to switch it out to where he controls the center of the cage. If he can do that, Park has to earn his respect back. That's the difference. On the feet, Park needs to earn the respect. Tavares doesn't, but Park opens everything up with the jab. So if you can't get the jab going, offense kind of dwindles, then you're shooting blind shots. So over two and a half rounds, I think that's a really comfortable play right there. But I'm, I think I'm willing to bet it all, brother. Let's go. Plus one fifteen. Uh, excuse me. Plus one fifteen on the Iron Turtle, Jun Young Park to win via decision. I think that that should be a way heavier line right there. Are you Are you following me? Are you telling me on this one? I'm telling you, brother, I like this one a lot, and I think that's the best outcome for Jung Young Park to go in this fight, right? Stay resilient, stay dominant, and, and avoid all the things that Brad Tavares is good at while you're putting on the things that you are good at. And we'll see what happens, man. Jung Young Park, 50% takedown accuracy, normally lands about two takedowns per fight. Let's see what he can do against Brad Tavares. That's a number that I cannot tell you, but I will say, like I said, over two and a half rounds or plus 115 for the decision prop on the Iron Turtle. Cash it all day long. It's a Bloody Water podcast. Contentious pick right there. All right, man.
Bang, bang, Chitty and Jaquani. Man, how the tables have turned, bro. Jared Gooden, the night train, right? He comes back. This dude was not quite around for a while, but he made his way back. He took an opportunity. And Chitty and Jaquani, who was a dude we were very, very hyped up when he was knocking out, uh, you know, Mark andre Barriol at the power bar or Dusko Todorovic, right? Then you get three straight losses. Gregory Rodriguez, Albert Durayev, and Mikhail Oleksichuk. Not bad losses at all. You bounce back against Reese McKee, but you had a split decision. AJ, now you get matched up against Jared Gooden. That's just kind of the trajectory that the career has taken. But we know that if Jared Gooden doesn't have some form of grappling to offer in front of Chidi and Jaquani, man, we might just see him straight tee off. We might see another knockout victory right here, but it can happen on both ends. So when I saw this fight, I didn't think that this was going to be a landslide on either end. I thought that this was very close and both dudes could knock each other out, man. So this is what's intriguing to me. How did you see it? Did you see Chidi as a massive favorite from the jump? No, actually, Derek, this is a very close fight in my book, man, because uh, if, if Jared Gooden is able to find those moments and tee off, he's going to put you to sleep. And how we've seen Chitty and Jaquani handle that kind of pressure as of late, especially with somebody who hits as hard as the night train, man, this will be a very explosive fight if Chitty isn't able to get some grappling working. My biggest concern, man, is Chitty and Jaquani again at 170 pounds. Dude's 35 years old, right? So he's just kind of getting up there. And the only reason I'm concerned is when you look at what's coming out back against them. Jared Gooden, man, yeah, he had a couple losses or one. He's 30 years old. This dude is young, bro. Not even in the prime of his career yet. And this dude is an athletic specimen. The kind that can have his hands straight down, walk in front of you, and just throw bombs at you. But you know what? Injaquani is going to be bringing in return a million teep kicks, timing you for an elbow, a step in elbow, grab you in the clinch, knees to the body. He's going to try to batter that gas tank as soon as he possibly can. Do you feel concerned that Jared Gooden can pull a repeat of what he did in his last fight against Wellington Terman, where he pretty much got teed off against for... Yeah, pretty much the better half of two rounds and then came back in, hurt Terman, and then just outlasted him, man. Terman gassed himself out. Gooden was able to withstand just on cardio alone. What do you think? I, it's always an option. Do I do I see Chitty gassing out in order to provide Goodman the uh, – or yeah, Gooden, excuse me, the uh, opportunity to do that? No, so I don't. that's why I don't think that could happen. But, mm -hmm. I mean – Jared Gooding can obviously have all the intangibles to be able to fight that kind of fight, man. We've seen it happen yeah. time and time again. Man, I'm a little more concerned with Njaquani's gas tank than you are then, man, because I've seen it. It just happens over and over again. And at 170 pounds, man, I mean, can you take the same shot that you could when you were fighting at middleweight? I'm not sure, but it's a smaller guy as well. Let's really break down the numbers, though, man. So Chitty Njaquani, he opened up as a minus 190 favorite, plus 140 comeback for Jared Gooden. Here's the thing that I'm interested in on both sides. Plus 250 TKO prop for Jared Gooden plus 160 TKO prop for Chitty and Jaquani. So if those are the, the knockout props, then what we need to take a look at next is going to be what is this over? The over that we're looking at right here, one and a half rounds, of course. Minus 155 for the over, plus 125 for the under. These dudes are fast starters, man. This is where I think this is the hardest, the hardest pick to make in this entire matchup. Does it go over or under one and a half? What's your thoughts? I actually think this one, we rock with the under, Derek. I got plus 125, very fast starters. Both of them have knockout power. And in order to get the fight where you need to, they need to go into the exchanges that cause these kind of chaos or mm -hmm. knockouts, right? Like like yeah. the moments where, like you said, step in elbows, things are happening in the clinch, those surprise attacks that both fighters are very good at finding and then hitting with power, that's yeah. what's going to cause these knockouts. And I see it happening before that uh, one and a half rounds. Jared Gooden, the last time that he got finished in a fight was against Impa Kasangani. It was a first round knockout. Prior to that, man, a lot of his losses are by decision. He's, he's able to be a really good nail. When he's losing, he can take it. So that's the only problem. He has good durability. Hmm, interesting. All right, I'm gonna we're gonna come back to that one. So you're a favor, you're you're favoring the under one and a half rounds on this one. We both like Chitty and Jaquani for the win. I think there is value in that plus two fifty TKO prop for Jared Gooden. But the thing that I want to look at more than anything right here, man, is if this fight gets extended, look at the decision props for both. Plus two ten decision for Jaquani and plus six twenty five for Gooden. I find it interesting that they're so heavy on Chitty for a decision prop right here when I would have had it inversed. What do you think? I would have had it inversed as well, Derek. Like you said, though, I mean, uh, Jared Gooden has lost a lot of his or a lot of his fights that he loses are by decision. But at the same point with Chitty and Jaquani and the things we've seen, I don't I don't see him being you know light on his foot in the third round. 
All right, well, let's go ahead and let's give it the final pick right here. Minus 190 was the open. Let's fight, let's be interesting right here. Minus 175 now for Chitty and Jaquani, so it hasn't shifted much. Are you saying let's just take that minus 175 money line on Chitty and just roll them right here, or are we getting deep on these props? What do you feel more comfortable with? I feel more comfortable with that minus 175 money line or even throwing that into a parlay than, than anything else, but uh, I, I just... This fight can be so close in so many different ways, right? Unless somebody just goes out there and dominates. But yeah. I see this one being a very much a, uh, a fire versus fire match. That's it, man. Let's just say Chitty, keep the chin tucked. And then Gooden, I mean, same thing. Gooden, keep your chin tucked, bro. <laughs> yeah, both of these dudes. All right, should be a banger. Chitty and Jaquani um, on a just pure money line, minus 175 currently right now. Go cash it in, folks. Go run to the sports book and make it happen. That should be a fun fight right there. But moving right on along, man. These have been some pretty binary matchups, some pretty good ones right here. This is the most surprising matchup that I have seen on the entire card right here, man. Grant Dawson, KGD Ga Dawson versus Rafa, the gifted one, Garcia. Hey, man. Grant Dawson, you lose a fight, bro. You lose to Bobby Green, and then what? What happened after the Bobby Green fight? No, that was it. Yeah, you lose to Bobby Green, your first loss in over ten fights or whatever, and then you get Rafa Garcia. This dude went Joe from like I'm on a. What, what you mean? Joe Selecki is not who he's fighting. That's who he fought last. Yeah, yeah, you said he fought Bobby Green. My bad. Yeah, after you lose though, right? You beat Joe Selecki, but now you get Rafa Garcia. All I'm saying is like. How did we even go to that? Where does that matchmaking come in? We got Marco Madsen, Jared Gooden, Demir Ismagulov, Bobby Green. Like, we're going up, up, up. Okay, Joe Selecki, you win dominantly. And then Rafa Garcia. I'm not saying Rafa Garcia is like a bad prospect. Don't get me wrong. But, like, brother, Grant Dawson was on the on the train to be like, hey, are, this, this is going to be a title fight right here. Like, this dude is going to work his way up to the title. So that's my question. Like, clearly... I'm baffled by getting Rafa Garcia, but maybe there's something in Rafa Garcia that I don't see because this dude is good too. Don't get me wrong. Rafa Garcia, let's see. F uh, three, four, five, six, seven. So yeah, seven wins in his last 10 fights, man. You can't be mad at that. What, what What's popping off the page for Rafa Garcia in this matchup? Uh, popping off the page, Derek, I would say consistency and then power, right? Like like he yeah. does have ways that, that he's able to be violent and throw some crazy ass strikes in there, throws bombs while he's in the pocket. Like this dude is down to to fight on the lead foot and then battle it out, right? So I do think there's some some intangibles that people like seeing when they're watching Rafa Garcia. But as far as the matchmaking in this one, man, I think as, as much as we love Grand Dawson, don't get me wrong, like I, I feel like Grand Dawson is one of those names for the hardcores that people love and want to see. But as far as the media and as far as the UFC machine that is pushing people, I don't see his fights as being the most exciting or most watched fights out there. So I think this is a, a, um, a good middle ground, if you will, right? Where, where this fighter, not necessarily, we had him on the hype train. We had Grand Dawson going up. Rafa Garcia is kind of in the middle now or in the, on the lower end, if you will, with all his decision fights. Now they're kind of meeting in the middle and it's one of those like, all right, well, and I don't, I don't want to say we didn't have anybody else, but we don't know where these two careers are going. Might as well fight each other to move on at least one of them forward. I figured it out, bro. I realize what it is now. He's getting the the Muhammad Makayev treatment right here. That's what's going on, right? They said, oh, your decision prop is minus 185. You're just going to lay on this dude for three rounds? All right, we're not going to give you fun fights. I'll give you a fun fight once you can actually finish somebody, but that's, again, where I'm a little bit confused because if you look at the victories, man, two, three, four, five, 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 like, submission wins, or no, four submission wins and one knockout win in his last 10. Like, this dude is a finisher, which, again, is going to make me go roundabout. This dude opens up minus 350 favorite against Rafa Garcia. We all know where Grant Dawson is supposed to be and who, who he should be fighting, right? So when you take a look at that one and you look at the different props and you say minus 185 decision prop for Dawson, for Rafa Garcia, his most valuable prop is a decision prop at plus 550 right here. This, to me, just seems like a gimme, right? Like, no value to be placed on Grant Dawson. What do you do here? So my question for you is, as a Dawson better, what do you do here? Do you just leave it alone and say, all right, man, well, we'll just pick, we'll pick it back up once we can get more value from a Dawson fight? No, Derek, I think if you're if you're looking for value in this one, we're either going to have to go to the over and unders or you're going to have to parlay that Grand Dawson with a decision onto something else, right? That's, that's the best odd. I do think that's the best way this fight's going to go, especially with the kind of fighter that Rafa is. I think we're going to see a lot of not necessarily stalemates, but a lot of trying to figure out what's happening in the fight for the two. So if you yeah. parlay that decision 185 with something else, even one we were talking about before, I think that's where you can find your money on Grand Dawson. 
Oh, so you mean you take a Grand Dawson money line and then you parlay that with the uh, Rodriguez Morono over two and a half rounds, like a prop lock? Or no, that was a parlay. I'm just kidding. But uh, you might as well prop lock it because yes, you are right. I thought the same thing, man. That's why that's the parlay, right? Because you're like, how else do I get value from a Grand Dawson fight with this line right here? But real quick, let's just take a look, man. Grand Dawson, Rafa Garcia, two and a half rounds, minus 265 for the over. My Lord, not looking good for my submission uh, prop lock right here. I, I don't see it, man. I don't see it. Rafa Garcia is very skilled, right? Like, here's my thing. He's a good boxer. No sub losses in his career. Jab and own the center of the cage. That's his style, right? But I see him more akin to fighting those guys. The Clay Gitas, right? The, uh, let me see who else he got. The uh, Jesse Ronson, Natan Levies, right? Like those guys. Chris, Chris uh, Grootsmacher. Like those guys, I'm like, hell yeah. Rafa Garcia, those are going to be fun competitive fights, right? But then you get Grant Dawson. And Grant Dawson, the only problem is, man, can he get the fight to the ground? Let's just answer that one uh, before we move on. Because we know for Grant Dawson, it's super, it's the same thing every single time, man. It's a single transition to a double, get him down, wrap around the back, and then just hang out there for the rest of the round, right? Like we know what the game plan is, but it's real stiff. It's very stiff and mechanical before we get there. Can Rafa Garcia make him pay on the feet? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, Derek, especially if Rafa is able to start off that jab. And then whenever Grant Dawson's trying to get on the inside, throws that chaos like I'm talking about, throw those bombs on the inside, he can hurt Grant Dawson for sure. Are you throwing any any hedge here on Garcia or is this a runaway for Grant Dawson? Yeah, I'm throwing a hedge on Garcia, man. If, if And I think if there's a way you're going to do it, you either do it by the money line or you go crazy and go with that TKO. You hesitate. I, I, I take back the TKO. I take back yeah, the TKO. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. Money line all day. <laughs> I was going to say, you hesitated. I don't believe you. We're betting on Grant Dawson, and we're calling it a lock right there, man. Hey, this should be a fun fight, though. Seriously, this will be a fun fight. Um, no value really to be placed here unless you're going to bet for an over or parlay it. So, again, just, just take the parlay. Uh, use the one that we had already gave you earlier. Go, you know, rewind the episode to go catch that or, uh, you know, be creative. But either way, Grant Dawson, that's the play right there. All right. All right, here it is. D-Rod, man. D-Rod versus Alex Morono. Welterweight contest and D-Rod, I'm not going to lie, I'm surprised. Opened up minus 200. Let's take a quick look. Let, let, let's just look just for, for um, humor sake right here where these gentlemen are at right now. So, uh, yeah, Rodriguez, Morono, minus 220. Oh, it's creeping. Plus 180 comeback from Morono, the great white. All right, AJ, let's be real with me because I could be, this could be ultimate cope for me. Ultimate copium, ultimate denialism right here for me. Yeah, Morono, you lost to Buckley, you lost to Ponzinibbio, you lost to Nico Price in a fight that you were winning and you just gassed out, but you took the fight on four weeks notice. Where did his stock drop? When did D-Rod become a kid? He's lost three fights in a row. How do you open up as a minus 220 favorite? And I'm not hating on D-Rod because I'm actually like a really big fan of D-Rod just like as a fighter in general, but I'm also a fan of winning money and just kind of like capping fights, bro. So like, where did I go wrong here? <laughs> I'm with you, Derek. When I saw this one, I expected Alex Morono to be the favorite going into this fight. Um, and, and I'm not really sure, to be completely honest with you, where he at least lost it with the UFC, right? Like like this guy, he, uh, Alex Morono is an ultimate company man, taking multiple fights on short notice, fighting whoever, whenever, and always giving it his all. I mean, yeah, he has had some instances where he's gassed out or where he's faltered in the fights, but to, to be the that big of an underdog when you put on that kind of work and shown us hardcores what you can get done, shocked me that he's the underdog, man. Yeah, you know, and especially for Daniel Rodriguez, interesting stat to no fault of his own. But the last time that Rodriguez won a fight at 170 pounds was against Kevin Lee in 2021. The last time you've won a fight in this weight class, bro. Now, again, to no fault of his own because dude's missing weight. He's having to fight catch weights all over the place, right? But three losses in a row, Kelvin Gastelum, Ian Gary, and Neil Magny. Now, are those bad names? No. Not at all. Those are fantastic names, actually. Only one that I would say is a little, eh, is the Kevin Gastelum one. But again, that was, dude didn't make weight. It, it got really weird, right? We have weight classes for a reason. But would you be able to say the same thing for Morono, Nico Price, Joaquin Buckley, Santa, Santa, uh, Santiago Ponzinibbio? Are those bad losses? No, those are great losses. So here we are. So that's this. All this tells me, folks, this is the reason. It's not even a matter of who wins, Rodriguez, Morono. This just tells me that from what we've watched, from the history of watching these fighters and looking at the numbers and assessing the fights, handicappers got it wrong somewhere here. So there is value to exploit. So let's exploit it. Let's look at the props more than anything else. I like Morono just as a pure dog because I think that this line is off. But if I'm looking at the props and you look at the decision prop, this is how I know that this is, this is recency bias. Plus 400 decision prop for Morono, plus 125 for Rodriguez. 
So they're banking on Morono gassing out right here. What do you think? Yeah, they're absolutely banking on him gassing out, not taking into consideration he's been prepping for this fight because I would have had it a little closer to even on that one, right? Like, like plus 200, plus 250 for both sides, maybe a plus 300 in there. But to, to say that Morono is going to consistently gas out every single time, and that's that's definitely a fallacy. And on the other end, on D-Rod, I mean, he's, he does struggle in those long style grappling fights right where where we're just the grapplers putting on and putting the pressure on like we saw with the kelvin gaslam one like we even see in the nicholas doll i guess not nicholas the nicholas doll is a different situation because but still the pressure right the pressure that's able to be put on you with however the fighter is going to be able to get this one to there that's what uh, d rod suffers with so i'm i'm a little shocked at that plus 125 decision i thought the tko prop would be a better one for him one thing that I'll point out is that I was searching for these props all week long, man, and they were kind of late because this was a kind of a late addition to the card, right? So, but they were kind of late on it. And I was like, man, why is it, what's taking so long? For a second, I was like, this fight might not take place. But I'm like watching videos of D Rod running in the mountains and whatnot and prepping and all that. So I'm like, the fight has to be going on. But this is what's interesting. Yeah, they gave them basically identical odds for the TKO and for the sub, and they're just banking on Morono not having a good gas tank here. So if anything, plus 400 decision prop for Morono is something that really intrigues me because I definitely think this fight's going to um, a decision. And the reason why is because Alex Morono falls into the... The group of fighters that I have a love-hate relationship with who have an incredible skill set but refuses to use it. This dude is a jiu-jitsu black belt who could really dominate with some grappling here because one of my notes for D-Rod is you cannot give up the takedown. Like, you cannot to give up the takedown. But Morono is like, cardio is the big question mark, but you got the grappling edge. Are you so afraid of gassing out, which is the number one fear in all combat sports, that you don't grapple because of that reason? You just go toe-to-toe. And you know what we're always going to say. He's, he's Dusko number two. Keep the chin down. Keep the chin down. Come on, tuck it. You know what I mean? Tuck it. But I'm just saying, what do you think? Yeah, no, that's uh, you hit the nail on the head, Derek. I mean, if, if Morono is going to win this fight, he's going to have to do it by sticking to his game plan, getting the fight to the ground. I even have the same note for Rodriguez cannot get controlled on the ground. Like that is yeah. his biggest thing right there. And if he is able to right hurt Morono, right, put the distance on and put some put the jabs together, put the combos together and then dip mm-hmm. out and glide. Morono seems to have a struggle with that, man. He starts getting the wide eyes, right? He starts looking, start kind of hands just reaching instead of being by your chin. And that's where I see that TKO pop at the plus 325 coming in handy. There we go. So this is the one contentious pick that we have of the card. Everything else is consensus right here. So I'm going to rock with Morono again. I think the lines are just off on this one and I'm taking value where I see it. So let's rock it. Dog play. Don't even bet on anything. Just plus 150 Alex Morono. Well, that was the open. Actually, let me let me tell you. He's currently yeah, plus 180. It's, it's swollen right there. So give me that all day. AJ, tell the people your pick for uh, for Rodriguez. A lot of recency bias going on that side, folks. But no, I'm with you. I'm rocking D-Rod over here. And like I said, plus 325. I'm expecting some reaching to happen. I'm expecting some fireworks to go. I like this fight. You know what they say. If you reach, we teach. All right, we'll see how it goes. All right, man. And then to open up the first bout of the night. This is an interesting matchup right here. Abdul Razak Al-Hassan versus Josh Fremd. I actually thought that they would run back that Cody Brundage fight because of that no contest, right? Where Al-Hassan just got up on him elbows ah you just caught him on the back of the head and nah, yeah, well no contest can he do it against josh fremd well different matchup right here but he still opened up as a favorite josh fremd is really interesting because of how big he is for the middleweight division this dude's frame is ridiculous this dude is six four aj six four dude has a 76 inch reach which really isn't that long al has 73 inch reach right but it's just such a different frame it makes me interested on if he could really utilize the grappling that he would want to work against al Hassan, who is such a tank right so Al Hassan, he gives us the Dolce Lungi and Bula vibes, right? Just big tank who can walk you down and can really do whatever he wants because his power in the first round is, is just, it's scary. It's, it's legitimately scary. Can Josh Fremd, first question, can he make it out of the first round against Al Hassan? That's what I was worried about, Derek, especially if you look at a lot of the losses that Fremd has. Sure, a couple of them are by submission, but you go back and you start looking. Even the Gregory Rodriguez, what was it, back in 2021, you go back a little further. There's a lot of TKOs that happen in that first round against Fremd, right? And with the power that uh, that Razak has, even at a minus 110 TKO, like it is very, very worrisome. I personally do not think it could happen. The fight that I looked at when I was watching tape on Fremd that I was like, how can we kind of mimic this fight against Al Hassan? I had to go back a little bit, man. It was the Treshawn Gore fight. That's the fight that I looked at. And only because Treshawn Gore is a really powerful fighter for his weight class. But what I noticed right there is, yeah, like this dude is long and lanky, but if he doesn't earn respect on the feet, man, he's going to... 
in the most respectful way possible, I see him getting ragdolled by these bigger, more powerful fighters in a grappling range. Because Al Hassan, while he's not he's not no jiu-jitsu black belt or anything like that, the dude is, I'm pretty sure he's a judo black belt, right? Uh, uh, judo Thunder is the nickname, right, for Al Hassan. So yeah, man, when it comes down to the grappling, it's not like Al Hassan can't hold his own, but I just think that he grabs him and tries to land the big one on him, or he just pushes him up against the cage and, and doesn't let Josh Frem to work his game. So the first thing that we need to look at is minus 110 for the TKO prop on Al Hassan. Josh Fremd for the last couple of losses. Roman Kopalov knocked him out. And Gregory Rodriguez knocked him out. Only two knockout losses in your last 10 fights. That's not bad. What do you think about the minus 110 prop? I like it for the fact what I, I'm expecting to happen in this fight was is Razak Al Hassan just pushing Fremd up against the cage, not allowing Fremd to have that distance. And then that's when the big bombs come into play. Right, either on the body, throwing them up to the head, especially now how we've seen a lot of this cage wrestling going in the UFC, it leaves a lot of opportunities for those knockouts. Yeah, man. Interesting too, right? Is that Frem doesn't even throw as much. Doesn't really land a lot of takedowns. It's like you gotta do something. You can't do it. Nothing against him, right? So look at the numbers, right? Minus 170 for Al Hassan, plus 140 for Josh Frem, the right here. Let me just see what these fight odds are looking like. Yeah, one and a half rounds. I think that that should mimic what we have here yep one and a half minus 140 for the over plus 110 for the under oh brother come on all right what's this what's what's the sake you're the 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 um uh, arbitrator of truth or whatever the phrase is <laughs> what, what are we rocking with here <laughs> i like this one Derek, especially because i'm looking at rizak al hassan and i'm i'm going with the under at plus 110 for that one and a half rounds man it makes a lot of sense to me right seven and a half minutes into this fight where mm -hmm. i expect al hassan to be able to control a lot of things right here it, it, it makes sense why it's close, but I like the under. Al Hassan has gone over two rounds three times in his last 10 fights, and uh, he does have a couple of first round first round finishes right here. If he goes nearly as fast as he did against Brundage, which I did not expect, I'm pretty sure for that fight, I bet over one and a half, and he just went out there and just like threw everything at him. If he goes with that same mentality, man, yeah, this thing can be over very, very quickly. So it should be an interesting one. Um, really, the play more than anything here is I think we just keep it super simple, right? Al Hassan, minus 170. I think that's a fair bet. I'm, that's a price that I'm willing to pay, I should say. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And especially if you're not willing to put it on that 110 TKO, because I do think that's it's 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 one of those where I feel like it's a snatch play, right? Like it's it's a full go, right? We're everybody's expecting the TKO. It doesn't happen. I like the minus 170 for the money line so he can finish it any amount of ways. Just humor me for this last one, man. Plus 600 submission prop for Josh Fremd. Anything? Woo! Plus six hundred, and uh, I mean Razak Al Hassan has been submitted. What only? Well, I guess only one time in his last uh, you last give ten. Him the Joe Pfeiffer treatment, bro. Joe Pfeiffer and just ragdoll arm triangle. What do you think? Ooh, he's got the frame for it. Fram does have the frame for it. If you're if you're feeling a little a little risky there, folks, plus six hundred is not the worst odds. The reason I didn't go through with it is because I was looking at the Joe Pfeiffer fight and I was like, Pfeiffer has something that Frem doesn't have, which is frame, right? You have big, tall, lanky frame, but he's also a powerhouse. That blast double came from the other side of the cage, naked, didn't even set it up. And he blast doubled him. He got him good, bro. It was, it was really good timing on that. So, all right, man, Al Hassan, Judo Thunder, that is the pick right there. Pure money line. We'll call it what it is. And with that being said. That is your main card breakdown, folks. So, you know, we got a couple more things that we need to jump into. But most importantly here, we need to jump into some bonus plays, baby. So we're going to do it a little bit different. Normally, we have it up on the screen. This go around, we're going to make a slight adjustment. And we're just kind of going to uh, pull up the ESPN sheet. And we're going to kind of browse through what we have available here. So, AJ, we got a full docket ahead of us. One of the fights that I wanted to take a look at for some of these bonus plays, and we'll just look at the, uh, the uh, fight odds that we have right here, is this one right here, man. This Jonathan Pierce versus pat sabatini two fantastic fantastic grapplers a lot of submission threat right here but more important than anything else man two and a half rounds minus 185 to me that is a lock right there like i should have made that another prop lock a dual prop lock right here because I'm, I'm really excited about that number what do you think I like it, Derek, and especially if you're looking at where I, because the prop I was looking at for this one, man, um, over two and a half, minus 165. So if you can find it right at that minus 165, 180, whatever it is, wherever you're finding it, that is a very, very nice one to hit, man. Over two and a half. I do think both of these guys with the skills they have can not necessarily nullify each other, mm -hmm. but provide those traps that make this a very intriguing fight. 
100%. Yeah, over two and a half rounds for two grapplers right here who are probably going to be a little bit hesitant because both of these dudes... I mean, let's not forget about Pierce, man. That's that... Remember that Brito fight. Hey, get up. Do something. And then you get choked out right after. Like, sheesh. And then Sabatini, he's had definitely rough luck getting knocked out, things of that nature. So that should be a very interesting one right there. This is one right here where I'm wondering if there's any juice in this Palastri versus McKenna fight. One thing that we know about Palastri, man, is that she can get a little frustrated in the cage. We saw that against... Uh, uh, Josephine Knutson and Corey McKenna, man, it's just hard for her every single time because she has to get a takedown. She kind of has to, or a, a good clinch. She has the shortest reach, like in the division, dude. It's less than sixty inches, like fifty-eight inches. Let me actually see right here. It's gonna, it'll tell us fifty-eight and a half inches, brother. Jeez, that's you know, that's short. Anyways, over is minus four twenty-five, so we know that right there. I mean, really, the only thing that you could play off of here, since they don't got those uh, extra props, is ultimately just going to be a money line. Do you see any juice in Corey McKenna as just a pure plus 110 dog against Julia Palastri here? I do, Derek. It's a hard one because I like Palastri a lot, but I see Corey McKenna working on the inside very, very well, especially the the, the team she's working with, Alpha Mel out there. Yep. They like to have that dog style of fighter, and, and if Corey McKenna can get on the inside and put some work and then frustrate Palastri, I see uh, Palastri not working that well off the back foot. Yeah, this this could be an interesting one right here because McKenna is one that's always kind of overlooked in, in her own way. But like you said, she comes from a great camp right here and she has the ability to pull the upset plus 110. I mean, that's not like she's a crazy dog or anything like that. And when I take a look, let me actually let me let me pull this up because I have the open right here. The open was plus 125 for the open so she's crept to plus 110 right here sorry i should have scrolled down a little bit she crept to plus 110 that means that by the time that the fight happens we might see her at even money if not a slight favorite so i would say get a little in on Corey mckenna where you can right now um yeah women's straw weight fight that should be interesting right here all right man this is one right here where I don't want to let the cat out the bag, but I'm just going to say banger alert. We're going to talk about it in a second, but this dude had in, right? This dude is good, man. Finisher. I will just say that. This dude's got all of his wins, 100% finish rate, seven, uh, seven wins, seven finishes. Dan Argetta, you know this dude is hungry, AJ. I'm going to talk about this all in a second, so I don't, I don't want to let the cat out the bag too bad. But what I do want to take a look at is the over two and a half rounds is minus 175. I might be looking at that under two and a half rounds if I'm looking at this fight right here because I think Haddon's going to come on strong, ready to try to take Argetta out of there. And the hunger that Argetta is going to try to bring to not just have a victory, but have like a decisive victory right here, something legit over a UFC newcomer. If he loses again, man, I think Argetta's out again, like legit. You know what I mean? Like it hasn't been that great of a run. So under two and a half rounds at plus 135. You like it or no? I like it, Derek. I'm glad you brought this one up. I had highlighted over it on my sheet as well because I do think Dan Argetta has a lot to prove. And then uh, Haddon is very, very dangerous, especially early in the fight. So I do think this provides all the necessary equipment to have it under that uh, one to one and a half rounds or two and a half rounds. Two and a half. Me. Yep. Two and a half rounds. All right, cool. And then before we move on here, AJ, because I know we just talked about a couple. Did you have anything that you wanted to uh, to hit on before we move on to sleepers? Oh, man, the one I was looking at, and we're going to talk about it in a second, right? The, the Rocha versus Carpenter fight. I like the under on this one, Derek. Both fighters very, very dangerous. Again, fast starters, young in the game, looking to prove a lot of stuff. I like the under on this one. And we're going to talk about this in a second right here, but I, I think that's fun too. Isn't it crazy that Carpenter is such a heavy favorite? 7-0 and versus the 17-1 and Rocha. We're going to talk about it in a second. You know what I mean? But like, oh my Lord. All right. Well, folks, there's your bonus plays right there. If, out of any of the ones that we just talked about, AJ, I'm kind of leaning on this JSP versus Sabatini more than anything else for the over two and a half, minus 185 or minus 165, whatever book you can get the price on. But uh, out of all of the ones that we just talked about right here, which was JSP over, uh, it was the Corey McKenna money line, just kind of dog play under two and a half rounds right here. And then you bet the under on this one too, or you're looking at the under, which one of those do you like the most? I'd have to go with the JSP. I like the yeah. JSP the most. I think it's going to be the most consistent all around to get that over. All right, fair play. Bonus plays, folks. You only get them here. Just remember, the entire ethos of the Bloody Water Podcast is to make you guys the most money as possible. But what we do is we give you all the picks, all the plays in uh, up front, and we let you enjoy the program. Well, this is the part that you don't get up front. You got to watch it. You got to earn it like a real one. And that's what the Bloody Water Podcast Army does. But we're not done. Now we're moving on to the unknowns of today, but the stars of tomorrow. That's right, folks. You heard it here first. The sleeper section, baby. Let's talk about it. Let's get it. It's time for some fun. 
white knight. If you ain't paying attention, you're going to sleep on me and I'm going to wake you up. All right, folks. So we pretty much let the cat out the bag a little bit with some of these bonus plays. But uh, do not worry. We still want to give you a very quick synopsis. We're at the bar. Beautiful women across the bar. And we got to let our buddy know, hey, listen, women are temporary fights, handicap, and legacy. It is forever. Let me show you about this sleeper that you're never going to forget. AJ, I'm going to bring up the big screen. And let me go ahead and let me, uh, let me pop it on. Talk to the people, brother. What do you got? Clayton Carpenter versus Lucas Roshan. This one, folks, this one's going to be an absolute banger. This is the ultimate definition of a sleeper fight right here. You got Carpenter 7-0, 5 finishes. Rocha 14 finishes, man. And like Derek said, 17-1. and He's coming in on the underdog. Don't know what's going on unless, unless you're watching, man. Clay Carpenter, he's a gangster. He can get this one done. Two young guns coming in here looking to prove something. This is sleeper written all over it. A couple uh, decisions you can see right there, but also a lot of knockouts on both sides, a lot of finishes. This one's going to be a very exciting fight. But how impressive, man. Edgar Chayadez. Look at that decision. Unanimous. Huh? Interesting. All right. This is going to be a fun fight. No, seriously. Like, tune in for this one. This is the first fight of the night, too. They open up the card with the bang right there. All right, folks. And then for mine, we just talked about it. But Dan, the determined Argetta versus Cody Haddon. Listen, this sleeper is really more about Cody Haddon than anything else. This dude has a 100% finish rate at 135 pounds right here. Five knockouts, two submissions. Composure. This dude is composed. He's fought legit guys. Like, he already fought Steve Ursag in Eternal MMA. That's that Australian promotion right here that develops high-level talent. That's his only loss. And in that loss, he was put in terrible spots by Ursag, and it went to a decision. Ursag could not finish him. So when you have a determined dude like this who's looking for a finish versus Dan Argetta, which I just mentioned in the bonus play section, who's, look at this, man. It's hard to find green on his side of the page, right? What we're looking for more than anything else is to get back on the board. This dude has six finishes and nine wins. Gritty grappler and he's ready to make the fight ugly folks tune in this is going to be fireworks right there and with that being said aj to conclude the program we're going to jump into some news and notes we don't have a ton of time but we have a couple things that i wanted to break down and there's no escaping it we had to get back we're going to circle all the way back to the beginning of this program where i said hey there was a couple couple robbery uh, reports right shiesty mass with the blicky on the hip ready to stick them up come on baby this is what we're talking about so for the news and notes, let's break open what we have here, and uh, let's kind of, hey, you know what, we'll, 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 we'll end on that one. Let's start with this. Justin Gaethje, he says he doesn't, uh, all right, let me, let me pause that, there we go. He doesn't need a trilogy fight with Dustin Poirier to feel satisfied with his career, but he says it does make sense. He knocked me out, I knocked him out, I'm okay with that. I'm sure it's a little bit more bitter for Dustin since I was the last one to win it, but it doesn't really matter. And if you want to go ahead and give the schmo fight next, love. who do you think that opponent should be? I mean, I don't know. It could be anybody, you know, it could be me, it could be anybody. Obviously, we fought twice, so it, it makes sense, but no idea what's going to happen. Do you need to feel satisfied for your career to have that trilogy fight with him? No, I don't. No. Well, no he knocked me out, I knocked him out. I mean, I, I'm okay with that. I'm sure that uh, it's a little bit more bitter for him since I was the last one to win, but it doesn't matter. And there you had it. Justin Gaethje doesn't care. He says, as long as I fight somebody who's honorable and respectful, then whatever, we'll get it. But yeah, give me your take, man. We're probably at the twilight of the Justin Gaethje and the Dustin Poirier career right here. So what are your thoughts? That's what I was going to say, Derek. When's the last time we've seen uh, Justin Gaethje kind of just indifferent on what happens, man? Usually this guy's a wild man. He's pushing for some kind of anything narrative, whatever you say, next fight. This is a, a, a interesting way to see an older man of, Dust, of uh, Justin Gaethje going into this, not really caring who the UFC throws at him. He's just there to make some cash, probably doesn't care about a belt anymore. It's interesting. Do you want to see it? I'm not sold, Derek. I mean, there's so many fighters. Don't get me wrong. I love to like, yes, would I pay to watch a Justin Gaethje fight against the Diamond? Absolutely. It's on there. That I'd love to see it happen. But is it the fight I'm super excited for and want to see time after time? Probably not. Yeah, I want to see these guys uh, hang it up in explosive glory. You know what I mean? That's what we're looking for. Maybe not fight the same guy a million times. Maybe fight somebody different. I don't know. Just a suggestion. All right. Um, all right, man. This was fresh off the, the print and press right here, man. Si me das bien, <laughs> you owe me one. Obrigado. <laughs> <laughs> If you're not familiar with what just happened, Alex Paeda, right, the, the current uh, light heavyweight champion, just defended his belt um, against Khalil Roundtree. His old foe, Artem Vahatov, 
Apologies, right? This dude beat him in kickboxing, right? So it's one of those stories over again where it's Adesanya, Pereira, but the difference is Adesanya had to convince Pereira off the couch by saying, hey, listen, that one dude was talking about he beat me that one time, right? Pereira, on the other hand, seems like he's just taking all of this in stride and being really grateful with it, being charismatic within his own weird self, right? By saying like, hey, my, my nemesis, my rival, the dude who beat me, right? Come on, give him a shot. Dana, come on. I know he didn't have the most impressive performance. He did get a finish, right? But there's a lot of clinching in that Dana White contender series fight. But he basically said, hey, give my man a shot. Let's see what happens. And Dana White's like, all right, brother, you got it. What do you make of it? I love it. This is this is what we're talking about. I forget the exact fighter that's saying it might have been Uncle Chael actually, where he was saying what you wanted to do is you want you whoever extended that hand for you, right? Pulled you up into the ladder. Now you got to do the same for the young guns coming down. You got to extend that hand down, pull them up into the club. That's exactly what Pereira is doing right here, man. I love to see it. This is how fighting should be. Very respectful. Everything's going. You want to see other people succeed. Just because you're in as well doesn't mean everybody else can't eat. Let them in. Yeah. Yeah. Let him in. And then let's see. Are they going to match him up? Are they going to fast track him? I don't know. No, we'll, we'll see. All right, man. Last couple of ones. Um, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap up here, man. So um, this is really, this is what we need to talk about, man. This is really the big, the big, just elephant in the room. Juliana Pena, man. She beat Raquel Pennington. At least the judges gave her uh, the fight right here. But the problem that we have here is, let me see if it's even going to show it. I don't think it's going to show it. Let me go to this next one. You see the headline, zero of the media members, which let's not forget, these are media members, these are not judges, zero people scored it for Juliana Pena, which is just like, it's bad. I mean, just like literally in the eyes of the people who watched it, like, nah, you didn't win. It was very clear, 48-47 in favor of Pennington. One dude did uh, <laughs> did give a draw on this matchup. But from what I was watching, a lot of people are saying, one, two, three, Pena, clear as day. Maybe Raquel ran away with it in the championship rounds. But you can't get away with the John Jones excuse Unless you were John Jones, where he says, well, don't the championship uh, rounds matter most? Well, that's not really how a fight works, but I mean, hey, whatever. Come on, brother. Shiesty mask, it's on. Juliana Pena. She broke the unwritten rule, which is you cannot steal a belt. You must earn it. You must take it. And uh, it sounds like she didn't take it. What do you think? Sounds like she didn't take it. I uh, I do want to say, I think in, in fighting... The last, you know, moments of the fight do matter, but in scoring an MMA yeah. bout, yeah, no, nah, it does, doesn't work like that. Points get scored for a reason. I mean, just to the visual eye, Derek, I was with you. I thought Pennington ran away with this fight, um, and I, I would score round three a little different. I mean, it was close. I, I don't know. I wouldn't give one, two, and three to Pena, though. Yeah, I mean, there's no way that she won four or five, you know what I mean? So it's like, so yeah, you got three rounds in there somehow, you know? But yeah, man, I just think that this is interesting because this is kind of one of the worst things that could happen, right? Because you got Pennington who's all like, well, give me a rematch. But it's like, well, you didn't defend your belt. So like, you can't really get a rematch. It's not quite how it works. And then you got Kayla Harrison, who everyone is just saying, like, this is basically Kayla, Kayla Harrison's the champion right now, pretty much, right? But who knows, man? Because the way that she had that fight against Ketlin Vera, that didn't make me super confident that she would be able to ragdoll Juliana Pena, especially with the cardio type stuff. So um, it's interesting. The women's bantamweight division is in such a terrible place right now, just with the lack of a true identity that you got Amanda Nunez teasing, being like, I might just come back and take the belt again, just because, because y'all don't know what to do with it. Let me, let me hop back up in there. You know what I mean? So give me the prediction. Do we see Amanda Nunez back in action? Do we ever see her fight again? And if she fights, will she make the cut to 135 or do they revive the featherweight division? If she fights, it's going to be 145, but I do not expect her to be in the UFC. We've seen crazier. I mean, shit, last week we saw Aldo come back for, what, a third time? So, yeah, I mean, it could happen. I don't expect it, though. All right, fair play. Well, that's a good place to end off on. Folks, episode 299, my lord. We're almost at 300 next week, baby. That's the big 300. Folks, again, just if you weren't aware, not only can you watch us in all our glory here on YouTube, but you can also listen now. So go back to Spotify, go back to Apple Podcasts, wherever you your preferred podcast player. I like Pocket Casts if you guys want a recommendation. No plug, no sponsorship. I just really enjoy um, the app right there. So go check them out. Um, but yeah, you could listen to us there. Most important thing I want to say is if you have any of those programs, rate us five stars. What are we talking about? But AJ, you get us out of here as always, brother. Take it away. Folks, like Derek said, man, we're going back to the podcast. Yeah, you're watching this on YouTube. And if you're watching this on podcast, man, let everybody know that we're back. We're going worldwide, right? We've already bit the brigade. We got the Armada going. We're about to take over everything else. Make sure you're not left behind. It's going to be a very fun week, folks. Make sure you get those bets in as well. That's it for us. UFC Vegas 98 in the books. We almost had UFC Vegas 100. That'll be interesting. All right, folks, that's it for us. Catch us next Friday. Until next time.
Peace.